A reading from the second letter of St. Peter. Beloved, wait for and hasten the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved in flames and the elements melted by fire. But according to his promise, we await new heavens and a new earth in which righteousness dwells. Therefore, beloved, since you await these things, be eager to be found without spot or blemish before him at peace, and consider the patience of our Lord as salvation. Therefore, beloved, since you are forewarned, be on your guard not to be led into the error of the unprincipled and to fall from your own stability, but grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. To him be glory, now and to the day of eternity. Amen. Verbum Domini.
Dominus Vobiscum. Lexio Sainte Evangelii Secundum Marcum. Gloria Tibi Domine. Some Pharisees and Herodians were sent to Jesus to ensnare him in his speech. They came and said to him, Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you are not concerned with anyone's opinion. You do not regard a person's status, but teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. Is it lawful to pay the census tax to Caesar or not? Should we pay or should we not pay? Knowing their hypocrisy, he said to them, Why are you testing me? Bring me a denarius to look at. They brought one to him, and he said to them, Whose image and inscription is this? They replied to him, Caesar's. So Jesus said to them, Repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to to God, they were utterly amazed at him. Ebum da homini, Dear Bishop, my dear friends, I tell you honestly, this morning I was praying the, the Holy Spirit to receive two special gifts. The first one is to improve my English. <laughs> and the second one is to facilitate your understanding of my homily. It's a pleasure to stay here with you this morning and to celebrate the Holy Eucharist. And I would like to dedicate some reflections uh, to this part of the Gospel of according to St. Mark. What Jesus is telling us today and what is the meaning of what he says for us today. As you know, the question is about the imperial tax imposed by the Romans in Palestine in the year 6 after Christ. It was logically despised by the Jews because such a tax was meaning submission and belonging to the emperor in that period was a Tiberius the emperor of Rome, and they were upset because the coins showed the portrait of the emperor. The Roman army brutally suppressed the revolt led by Judas of Galilee, a revolt which erupted when Judea was annexed to the Roman Empire. It is interesting 
because here is what Jesus is telling us, teacher. Is, is understandable. The Pharisees and their audience are united in trying to set a trap for Jesus, but at the same time they admire his sincerity. Jesus is a free man in making and carrying out decisions. They tell it very clearly. Teacher, we know that you are a truthful man and that you are not concerned with anyone's opinion. The, the question is quite, quite clear and important, I would say. It is at the same time political and messianic. Why? Because the problem is if to recognize the oppression of the people, and the people of Palestine were oppressed by the Romans. They had to pay the imperial tax. But at the same time, it's messianic because the problem is to see if they are responding to the expectations of a liberating Messiah. The question brought to Jesus is not to find out the truth. This is important. They don't put the question just because they wanted to know the truth. They ask instead an hypocritical question. And Jesus does not avoid the question, and he does not fall into their trap. But his question escapes the way in which Jesus liberates from any power. He liberates with the service which totally eliminates any power or servitude. Repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. We can realize that Jesus does not give an evasive answer. Jesus recalls the absolute dominion of God, who has, as Luke, the Gospel of Luke, chapter 1, says, he has thrown down the rulers from their thrones, and in whose, in whose presence all their idols fall and break apart. The response is understood by all. For its subversive meaning, they accuse him, saying, we found this man misleading our people. He opposes the payment of taxes to Caesar and maintains that he is the Messiah, a king, as Luke is referring to us in chapter 23. So the people who are listening at him, they understand perfectly what is the meaning of this affirmation? But uh, I think that for us today, at the root of it all is the affirmation that in Jesus, the ultimate and decisive dominion of God is present. This is the root of the true freedom of the human person and it is present in the exceptional way of the life and death of Jesus. In him, the time of alienation and hope for liberation has ended. And it is finally possible to give to God what belongs to God. Only in him. Be careful. Only in Jesus we can give to God what belongs to God. Only in Jesus it is possible to establish the reign of justice, peace, and love which God has promised. At the same time, and this is our problem, conversion is necessary. 
changing our ways. Believing in the gospel and following the path of Jesus. And the response of Jesus is the revelation of his own person as the fulfillment of every hope. We can realize he is not dividing the material order under the reign of Caesar from the spiritual order under the reign of God. There is only one God. And he is the Lord of our entire being and reality. We can remember quite clearly what Jesus was saying that man cannot serve two masters. In Jesus, man can finally belong to God and see his hidden face which is an image quite different from that stamped on the Roman coin. God's own freedom is the true glory of man for man. In him comes the decisive moment to choose. It is our problem every day. Either God or Caesar. Either the freedom of Christ or the submission to the Caesar of the day. And the response cannot, of Jesus cannot be understood as a simple separation of spheres or to make a subtle distinction between the socio-political and religious realities. These distinctions would have been ignored during the, those biblical times. The gospel tell us, tells us that the world and humanity are of God. And that God is one. The Lord is pleased with all its, his creatures, which are good. And he does not accept falsehood. The creatures are not absolute, but relative. I think that this is, must be stressed very clearly every day. Because we have a big temptation to make absolute what is only relative. And creatures, whatever creature, is only relative and not absolute. And this is the lack of meaning in the world of production, of politics, of culture. This world has become absolute and no longer serves man. This is the great danger that we are facing today, my dear friends. Because we are making an absolute of all these things. I'm talking about production. I'm talking about politics. I'm talking also about culture. And becoming an absolute, they don't serve anymore man. And man also has become an absolute and no longer serves God. This is the history of what we call our original sin. And the man finds himself naked, like, like Adam in that day, without any meaning, an orphan of the creator whose image he reflects. Nobody can take the place of God. Only this way can everyone and everything have meaning and rediscover their value, freedom and autonomy in relationship with other things. 
repay to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, repay to God what belongs to God. And I think that this morning we are all of us invited to rediscover our meaning in God, the value of our life, the meaning of our life. I would say the taste of our life. Allow me to end with two reflections more. They were giving me a scheduled time. <laughs> well, precise. And so I cannot be so long. And, and you are quite happy for this. Uh, I think there are two things that for me are important. The first one, when I was young, I could not understand why so often Jesus was telling to his disciples, courage. Don't be afraid. Now that uh, I was uh, already passing a lot of time in my life, I rediscover in my living what is the real meaning of this courage, don't be afraid. Because when you are young, you don't understand this fully because you don't need courage, I would say. You have already. You have a kind of enthusiasm. But uh, at my age, I think that uh, is quite understandable what is the real meaning. It is, it is so important to perceive my Lord Jesus at my side that is telling me in many moments of my daily living, courage, don't be afraid. I am with you. And this is the point that really is so minimal, meaningful for our life. Don't worry. Don't be afraid. And the second reflection really connected with this, to give to God what belongs to God, is the question that Jesus is is placing in front of Peter, do you remember? Peter, do you love me? And, and Peter is answering, you know that I love you. I don't want to make any question now about the Greek verb, about uh, agapa or phileo, because it is interesting. But it, what I like is that Peter is answering, you know that I love you. I think that every day the same question is posed to us. The same question. But do you love me? When I was younger, I, I saw a, a nice new movie, Fiddler on the Roof. I don't know if you ever seen that. <laughs> and there was a question that the husband is putting to his wife, do you love me? And the wife, as usual, is answering with very a little story. Yeah, I do this for you, I do this, I do this, I do this. But the husband is not so pleased. He's putting again the same question, but do you love me? And uh, with Jesus and with our Lord, it can happen the same. When at the question we can answer, I do this for you, I do this for you, I do this for you. But uh, our Lord is placing the same question again, but do you love me? How happy we are if for us it is possible to give the same answer of Peter. My Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And this is why we are here. And this is why we celebrate the Eucharist together. And this is why we are involved in so many, in many activities for the good of God and the good of the church. Do you love me?
my best wish for you and for me also is that we can give the same answer of Peter. You know everything. You know that I love you. 